Kia ora everyone, we're at Roundhead Studios today. We're here during the New Zealand producer sessions. I'm here with Guy Massey, one of the two British boffins here to teach local producers a thing or two. Guy Massey, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you very much. Welcome to Roundhead Studios. I see you've seemed to have made yourself at home. Absolutely, yeah. A long day yesterday, uh, getting used to, used to this beast. Um, beautiful studio, and I'm absolutely loving the vibe here. Yeah, it's lovely. You're here for the New Zealand Producers Series, where you're taking aspiring local guys yeah. through, through the ropes. What's the bigger purpose of, of the series? Um, uh, I guess to illustrate uh, our career paths and mm. how we achieved what, you know, our, our careers um, in a changing world in some ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, w we had a seminar yesterday where we, were, we described how, what, what our paths were. And I guess for guys these days, it's not the same because there's not as many studios anymore. There's, there used to be a real hierarchy where you, you would start as a T-boy, if that, and you may maybe work on reception for six months, then you'd be a T-boy, then you'd become an assistant, uh, and then you'd be a, um, well, you know, you'd be a tape up first, actually, then an assistant, and then you could engineer. Right. And, and for me, that took five years. You're right. Uh, when I started. But nowadays, you know, I guess a lot of students go to SAE and they're like, okay, let's, let, let's get into, into the business and then there are no studios, mm -hmm. or f far less. Right. Um, so I guess uh, we're, we're trying to impart, you know, what we know. Um, and as I think the studio is probably the, the flagship studio in Auckland and probably New Zealand. Sure. Um, w this is the sort of vibe I would expect to work in when tracking. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of these guys have got their own places. Yes. Um, so hopefully some of the information we're, we're, you know, giving to them will help them create better recordings in, in, in their environments. But we're, we're also really open to learning stuff from them too, you know. You're, so you're here to give these guys the benefit of experiences that you would have had in the British recording industry. Yes. Which probably doesn't trickle down um, to this New Zealand recording industry being a smaller thing. Yeah. In your very impressive CV, and trust me it goes on for pages, um, <laughs> One of the, there's many names that's, that um, jump out, but uh, one of the biggest names, I guess, is the Beatles, and clearly you, you're a younger man than they are. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you worked on the remastering of many of, of their albums. Which, I did, yeah. Which won, won a Grammy. Yes. Which brings me to the question, what is remastering? Is it like restoring a chair or rewrapping a mummy, or what is it? Uh, well, I guess uh, for us it was, um, it was a double-edged thing, really, because... Obviously, the canon of, of you know the, the Beatles material is very well respected. A lot of people would have been of the idea of like, don't touch it. It's it's per perfection as it is. Um, but we were given the job to basically when they were transferred to uh, to CD or, or the CD the first CDs were brought out in '87. The technology used there um, was great, but. Digital uh, uh, technology had advanced so much further by the time we were asked to do it in 2005, I guess, is when we started. So remastering for us in that sense was getting the best transfer we possibly could from the master uh, mixes. Mm. So we'd, you know, we'd put the, the master uh, two-track tape or mono tape um, uh, through this process and capture it high resolution. And then after that, we uh, the remastering for this, uh, you know, this canon of songs was um, can we improve it in any way? So if there was a vocal pop somewhere that um, annoyed us, if it, if it pulled your ear from enjoying the song, we had technology that we could remove the vocal pop, uh, clicks, things like that. Mm -hmm. So there was a restoration period. So once the transfer was done, we restored in that sense. And then we took it up to the mastering room where Steve Rook uh, and I would then we, we sort of built a new master um, from the transfer and cutting in these little restored pieces and then we'd run it through an old TG console uh, capture and console um, giving it some EQ if we felt it needed it uh, so remastering in that sense would be for us was uh, you know the, the recapture of the masters um, uh, the restoration period and then recapture into another computer where the new masters would be made uh, as in the CD masters. That's interesting. Does working in a essentially in what is now an MP3 world when you're doing that high end, such detailed work, is it frustrating that the, the the you know the hours that you will sweat 
doing that kind of work may not be appreciated by most of the people that will be listening to them on their earbuds? Um, it's not really, no, because I guess when one works on doing remastering or, or making records, mm. you know, our job is to make it sound the best that we possibly can with the tools that we have. Mm. And I guess I never re really think about that end game that much. I think it's fine to walk, you know, to mm. make MP3 copies and walk around with your earbuds when you're on the <laughs> bus or travelling or whatever. Um, I mean, one thing that frustrates me a little bit is, uh, and I talked to my son about this a few weeks ago, is he listens to a lot of of his music streaming uh, via YouTube, and the quality difference between that and a decent MP3 mm. is miles apart. Right. So I think there's a lot of kids growing up with the, with the with the notion that that's how music's supposed to sound when it's streamed in in really bad quality on YouTube. Mm. I mean, I put a Pretenders album on with him the other day, the vinyl, and then streamed it from YouTube, and he was like, "That sounds so different." And they said, "Well, that's what it's supposed to sound like." Right. And it was like no low end. It was bright and harsh in the you know in the streaming version. So mm. I think, in some ways, a lot of kids who listen to music don't really know what it's supposed to sound like, which that is a bit frustrating. Mm. Not frustrating, it just saddens me a bit, really. Sure. Um, I guess you're part of a fairly unique generation in engineers and producers, and that you've had the analog tape experience, and you've had to adapt um, through the last two decades to the, the Pro Tools and the and beyond era. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I first uh, was introduced to digital EQ, um, when I was at Abbey Road, I was very Luddite about that, and it was like, I'm not using that. <laughs> um, but, you know, over the years, uh, with, with companies like Waves and UAD, who, whose emulations of the old analog gear are really good, hmm. um, I'm much less sniffy about that. Right. So you're here talking to young, aspiring New Zealand producers. What's the one piece of advice you wish you had had at their stage of, of career? Um, I guess no one really told me how, uh, uh, not how hard it was. I mean, uh, I've, I've found that your, your friend uh, and social, uh, social base shrinks <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> because, I mean, when I first started working, I, I, I worked all the hours that God gave me, really, do you know what I mean? To, mm. to, to, I had a vision of being, because uh, I really wanted to be a great engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I maybe didn't want to produce at that point. Uh, that's changed, because I, I do love production now. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess if someone had said to me, you have to kiss goodbye to certain elements of your life, <laughs> um, that, that, that would have, it would have made me think differently, but uh, I wouldn't have changed it. Right. Because for me, music has been ingrained in my life for so long, I can't imagine doing anything else. Sure. And I, I, I dearly love my job on a day-to-day -day basis. There's nothing better for me. Right. You know, I really, I, I do love it. And there are, you have bad days, of course, and you're tired often and all those things, but um, I, I, yeah, I couldn't think of doing anything else really. Good.